Hi, welcome to Math 355, Lecture 14. And so this is, I think, the hottest lecture of the semester, not because of the content, but because we've just had a two-week spring break. And it is always you know, very jarring to come back after being gone for so long. And this is why I deliberately adjusted the course so that we finished Chapter 5 right before here. We're studying something new. And I really didn't want you to be doing too much reading beforehand so we can you know, ease back into things today and try to think about what is the right way to define certain operations. And you know, again, most of you are not gonna become you know, professional mathematicians working in academia. Most of you are not gonna use most of this material. You know, what are we getting out of a class like this? It's how to think about problems. And you know, one of the biggest things is trying to decide what do we want to study? What's a good thing to investigate? And that's one of the big themes of today, I think, uh, Silverman does a really nice job in the text of going through an example and trying to figure out, you know, when can we define things? What kind of additional properties do we need? And so the first thing is to just, you know, recall something from your know, early in the semester. As always, G is a group. And whenever we use H, it should be a subgroup. So H is a subgroup of G. We denote the left subsets of G by G mod H, you know, written like this. So we've talked about lots of examples of something like this. All the different cosets have the same size. Whatever the size of H is, they all have the same size. And there's a lot of questions you could ask about this. And so can somebody give me an example of a set and a subgroup where we might want to form these cosets? What's our standard example where we take a set and we mod something out? Clock loop. So we could take you know, G equals Z. We could take H equals maybe some multiple N times Z. And we could study the clock group, you know, Z mod NZ. And really that's the same as you know, the set, you know, zero, one, two, dot, 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 n minus one under clock addition. Okay. Now, in a situation like this, if I give you, you know, two different cosets, you know, so if I give you, um, you know, a plus nz, plus B plus NZ, what would this equal? No, we're writing things additively. Yes, yeah, so one thing is we could write it as A plus B mod N plus NZ, or we could write it as A plus B plus NZ. Because remember, cosets don't have unique representation. You know, I can change it by a little bit and it's still gonna represent the same set of elements. So if I look at all the numbers congruent to five, you know, I can write all those numbers, um, you say five, five, five on the clock with 12 hours, you know, it would be five, it would be 17 and so on and so on. I could use five as my representative, I could also use 17. And so in this situation, we have the very nice case that there's actually a group structure on the cosets. I can take two cosets and I can add them. Does a coset have an inverse? So this would give us closure. Do we have an inverse? What would be the inverse of the coset A plus NZ? You could do it as minus a. How else could you write minus a? Minus a is fine, but there's a nicer way. N minus a. And then you know, we've written something in terms of you know, some number between zero and n minus one. But minus a is fine as well. So there's our inverses. That's going to just be zero plus nz. That's our identity. And what's the last property we need? Associativity. As you just go through and you just check that associativity holds. So we have a structure here. 
So the question is, will we always have this structure? No matter what group we take, no matter what subgroup, will the cosets always form a subgroup? And if so, the hope is maybe the way we can understand a complicated group G is we take a subgroup and then we understand the coset group and we understand H and then we have some way of understanding G by understanding G mod H and H. And both G mod H and H should be smaller and less complicated than G. And the idea is we just keep breaking it up, keep breaking it up, keep breaking it up. Okay, so let's see if we can always do this. So here's the proposed coset multiplication algorithm. So G is always as a group, H is always as a subgroup. The input is we take two different cosets, C1 and C2 of H. We choose an element G1 in C1 and G2 in C2. So we choose two different elements, one from each coset, and then we form a new coset, G1, G2, H. Remember, we can write groups either additively or multiplicatively. When you write a group additively, what should you be thinking about the group? Doesn't have to be, whenever we do additive, what, should, what other additional property should you be thinking about for the group? So this is a property that not every group has, but it's wonderful if it has it. I'm sorry, no, every group has an inverse. Commutative, abelian. So whenever we use the plus sign, you should be thinking it's probably abelian, it's probably commutative. Most groups may not be abelian. So in general, we'll use multiplication when we don't know. And so here we're just writing everything multiplicatively. Really, there's a binary operation and I need some way of representing it. For the last one, we just used addition because it was the standard clock group. So here is a proposed way to form a multiplication to form an operation on the cosets. If I want to take two cosets and get a new coset, what I do is I choose any element in the first, I choose any element in the second, I take their product, and I use that as my representative. And so that's what I then multiply H by. And you can go through and you can see that for the previous problem, this is going to be a perfect definition. What concern do you have about this definition? What might you be worried about? So you have any concerns? So I take two cosets and I choose anything in C1, I choose anything in C2, and I look at the product. Well, so this will be closed because I'm going to get a new coset, right? So G1, G2H is still going to be a coset. So closure, you should always be worried about whether or not it's closed, but it will be closed. But which one of C1 times C2 to be G1, G2H, where G1 was in C1 and G2 was in C2? We chose some element in the first, we chose some element in the second. Yeah, what if... What if took G1 prime in C1 and G2 prime in C2? Is G1, G2, H equal to G1 prime, G2 prime, H? It would be terrible if that were the case. Because then if I want to multiply cosets, I mean, what we're really trying to do here morally If I have G1H times G2H, I want to say that that equals G1, G2H. I just put the two Gs together. But the problem is if I have, say, G1 prime of H and G2 prime of H, and these are the same, this would then be G1 prime 
g2 prime of h, are these the same? So just because these cosets are the same, when I'm doing my multiplication like this, I might not actually get the same coset back. Can you give me a condition where you definitely will get the same coset? Maybe if you can't prove it, what's your intuition thing? What might be a good condition on G or H that might make everything work out? If G is So what condition on G might make everything fine? So that's really restricted, but you know, if G is the identity, everything is fine. So how can you generalize G as the identity? What kind of property might be good, which might make everything work out with all the multiplication? We don't have that many properties for groups to have beyond the basic definitions. In your dream world, what property would you want your group to have? Abelian. So okay if G is commutative. But you, you should always be thinking, what properties do I have that would make things nice? You know, If the group is abelian, is everything going to work out? What about in general? And so there's a really nice example. Uh, this was first done, I think, back in chapter two. So they consider the dihedral group. So you have an equilateral triangle with the vertices labeled one, two, and three. And we have six different operations we can do. We have the identity, E, which does nothing. We have R1, which flips, I'm sorry, which rotates 120 degrees. And it sends one to two, it sends two to three, it sends three to one. We have R2, which rotates 120 degrees the other direction. Then we have flipping about um, the line connecting one and the side opposite. So that flips two and three. Then we have the flip about one and two. And then we have the flip about One and three. So I can't write these down. So good notation for the first one is we have one, two, three, and then we write below what everything goes to. One goes to one, two goes to two, three goes to three. The second one, what does one go to? So what do we think one goes to? Does it go to three or does it go to two? So initially one was supposed to be in the bottom left, right? That's where the triangle started. And now after applying our one, one has now moved to the two spot. So one goes to two, two now goes to the three spot and three goes to one. Let's look at the next one. So now we started with one in the bottom left corner, one ends up in the top where the, it's the three spots. So one goes to three. Where does two go to? Two started off in the bottom right, it's now moved to the bottom left, two goes to the one spot. Do I have to do any extensive calculation to figure out where three goes to? No, where does three have to go to? Why? Because you know, it's the only thing that's left. You know, we, we're just rotating. You can't have two things going to the same thing. Once I know where two out of the three things go, the third one is forced on me. So this is really nice compact notation. I, for the flips, so one stays the same in the first, 
So one, two, three, one goes to one. In the second, which one stays the same? In the second, three stays the same. And in the third, which one stays the same? Two. So when I'm trying to figure things out, you know, I can look at the picture or it could be kind of lazy in the first. So if I'm trying to think of flip one, I know one goes to one and I know two is not fixed. You know, two is moving. Where does two have to go to? Three it has to go to three and three has to go to two. And for the next one, one has to go to two, two has to go to one. And then one has to go to three, three has to go to one. So these give me my, you know, different ways of writing, you know, down what's going on. So I can represent the identity, I can represent the rotations. And if I want to figure out what would be, say, a rotation followed by a flip, I could write it down and I could do the calculation. So if I want to do first the rotation, maybe R1, that's, you know, one, two, three, two, three, one. And if I want to do a flip after that, let's say I'm going to do the flip, um, F1, which is, you know, one, two, three, one, three, two, we can figure out what this is. So when we look at the red, we send one to two, then we apply a green, which sends two to three. So where does one have to go to? It has to go to three. If we look at the second, element two, well, the red sends two to three, the green sends three to two. So two just goes to two, so then three goes to one. So we've just shown here is the red was R1, the green was F1, and their product is one, two, three, three, two, one, is just F3. So we can go through and we can figure out what all the different multiplications are, okay? This is just roll up your sleeves and do the calculation. I strongly urge you to go through and play with examples like this. You know, the more brute force calculations you do, the more you're going to understand what's going on. And we can go and we can try to figure out what happens as different elements in each element. Do you think that this group is commutative? is like flipping and then rotating the same as rotating and then flipping. Well, let's check. Let's do things in the opposite order. Let's do, um, we'll do the rotation second and we'll do the flip first. So we have one, two, three, one, three, two. And then there'll be F1, the R1 over here. And then let's see what we would get. So now one goes to one in the green and then one goes to two, that's already enough to show that it's not the same, right? I don't have to do anything further. I know it's not the same, but let's keep going. Two goes to three in green, and then in red, three goes to one. Okay, so then three has to go to three. So I've now got the flip that flips one and two. The one that flips one and two is F2. So it's not commutative. So this is a great example of a non-commutative group. So again, you should have examples at your disposal that you can use to test things. If you only test things on groups that are commutative, well, it might be the case that it only works when your group is commutative. You wanna test things on a group that's non-commutative. This is the simplest one that you can really think about. And we see that F1, R1 is not the same as R1, F1. And maybe that's gonna cause some trouble. Okay, so it turns out that for all cosets, you know, C1 and C2 of H, for all pairs of elements G1, G1 prime in C1, and for all pairs of elements G2, G2 prime in C2, we want G1, G2, H to be the same as G1 prime, G2 prime of H. If something like this is true, then we will be in a situation where we can define coset multiplication. The way things are right now, unfortunately, it's not enough to just say 
um, that we take a representative. And so I will leave you to look at the book. So read book, read example in book. So the book goes through and carefully shows you that if you look at this group D3, there is a subgroup H you can choose where when you form the cosets, it matters which representatives you take. If people want me to do that in class, email me and I will split and I'll make Thursday where one class is we do examples and one class we do theory. If you don't want me to do that, don't email me, okay? So it's a question of, you know, can you read the book and follow the example? If you can't, that's great. I'm not gonna spend time on it. If you want me to go through and do the details, I will. But if you go through and just do the multiplication out, you will see that unfortunately, it matters which coset representatives we take. All we have to do is find one example where this breaks down to know that we're in trouble. And for the group you know, D3, which we just looked at before, one of the subgroups is such that it matters which coset representatives you take when you multiply like this. You're not always gonna have G1, G2, H equaling G1 prime, G2 prime H. So then the question becomes, what condition must we impose on the subgroup H so that it doesn't matter which representatives we take. And it may be the case that there's no nice condition. Fortunately, there is. Now, you always want to get a sense of what is the smallest condition you need. You want to cover as many cases as possible. So it turns out if G is commutative, everything is going to be fine. But can we come up with something weaker? And so what's interesting is when you look at the example in the book, one of the subgroups works. One of the subgroups does not work. Well, I guess it should be a little bit more specific. Uh, when you're looking at trying to do coset multiplication, can you give me an H that will always work? The identity, right? And there's another H that will always work. Everything, right? So we really are not excited about those as examples. It's, can you find me a non-trivial subgroup? It's not the identity, it's not the full group where I can define coset multiplication. And if so, I can then try to break G into something smaller. And it turns out for this example, one of them works, one of them doesn't work. And I'll leave that to you to go through the details and see, and again, this is how you learn math, is you do it yourself. You don't listen to someone doing it. You do the calculation. And when you do the calculation, you start to get a sense of why things break down. So the claim is that imagine we have an H that has this incredibly special property. No matter what elements G1 and G1 prime you take in C1, and no matter what elements you take G2, G2 prime in C2, imagine you always have G1, G2, H equals G1 prime, G2 prime H. It turns out if that's true, we can then define coset multiplication. What's going on? So we wanna start off with, we have you know, C1 is G1 H, and it's also G1 prime H, and C2 is G2 H, and it's also G2 prime of H. So what does it mean if G1 H equals G1 prime H? So what does it mean if those two cosets are the same? So what would it mean for two cosets to be the same? What must be true about G1 and G1 prime? One possibility is they're the same, but is that the only way two cosets can be the same? When we went back to the clock group, so, so when we, let's say we have 12 hours and I look at the coset you know, five plus 12 Z, what's the same as five plus 12 Z? Seventeen plus twelve z. 
So what do five and 17 have in common? So what's, what do five and 17 have in common on a clock with 12 hours that five and 13 don't have in common? They're equivalent. What does it mean to be equivalent? So one or two numbers equivalent on a clock. The remainder, yes. The, the remainder is the same. They differ by an element in H. So over here, if I tell you G1H equals G1 prime of H, what does that mean about G1 and G1 prime? They differ by an element in H. So there exists an H1 in H such that G1 equals G1 prime H1. There exists an H2 in H such that G2 equals G2 prime H2. That's what it means for two cosets to be the same. Because again, Remember, the identity element is in H. And if I give you any element like H1, H1 inverse is also in H. So if I multiply big H by little h, I just get back big H. We've seen this before. So two cosets are the same if and only if they differ by um, you know, the representative you know, having this extra factor of something from H. G1, G2, H equal G1 prime, G2 prime of H. And that's going to be the same G1 is going to be G1 prime H1, and then G2 is going to be G2 prime H2. So if we want G1 prime H1, G2 prime H2, we want this and this to be the same. Well, do they have to be, uh, do they have to be identical? No, so how close can they be? Another H, so we want, G1 prime, G2 prime to be G1 prime H1, G2 prime H2 times H for some H and H. And so the goal is to try to figure out um, you know, what kind of properties do we need on H? so that this will be true. We're trying to have this expression equal G1 prime, G2 prime. Does this look a little bit like G1 prime, G2 prime? How does it look a little bit like that? So if the H's were commutative, you could see everything is fine. So here, it's okay if commutative. So as a nice aside, we've now just proven the claim earlier that if H that if G is commutative, everything is fine. And in fact, I'm sorry, if G is commutative, everything is fine. Actually, all we need is that H is, is the center of G. So the center is everything that commutes with everything else in the group. And so if you take the center, you would be fine. If the group is abelian, then everything's in the center. So, okay, if H equals the center. But when we look at this, we want to have G1 prime, G2 prime equals G1 prime, H1, G2 prime, H2, H for some H. Does the first expression look a little bit like the second expression? Do they have anything good in common? 
So do they, they both start off with G1 prime, G2 prime? They both start off with G1. What would you like the second one to have next? So let's just write this as we want G1 prime, G2 prime equals G1 prime, G2 prime. Can I just put a G2 prime there? I can't just put in a G2 prime, right? I'd like to. I'd love to just put in and just shove in a G2 prime, but I can't. What could I do that would allow myself to put in a G2 prime? I could put in G2 prime, G2 prime inverse. That's legal. And now this over here is gonna be G1 prime, G2 prime. And then I'm gonna have G2 prime inverse H1, G2 prime, H2, H. This is in H. If in H we win. So if G2 prime inverse H1, G2 prime, if that's in H, we're going to win. Because then, yes, we will have G1 prime, G2 prime is G1 prime, G2 prime times something in H. So what I hope you're seeing is that we're coming to a natural condition. You know, we want the coset multiplication to be independent of the choice of representative. So we say, okay, well, we've got G1H for one of them, we've got G1 prime for the other representative. And then we do the same for the second coset. And we look at what would be a condition that would guarantee that the products would be the same, no matter which representative we take. I am not saying that this is the only condition that works. I'm saying if this condition held, then we would be in good shape. So what we're saying is imagine you have a subgroup H with the wonderful property that no matter what element you take, G2 prime H, I'm sorry, G2 prime inverse H1, G2 prime is in H. So the condition is we want for all G in G, for all H in H, G inverse H, G, to be an H. That is a really nice condition. And if that's true, then coset multiplication is well-defined. So is everybody comfortable with this? Does anybody have any idea which subgroups have this property? No. But we've at least extracted if this property holds, then we can define coset multiplication. Yes. And we will see the name extremely quickly. Okay. And as promised, we will now see the name. So let G be a group as always, let H be a subgroup as always, let G be an element in G, then the G conjugate of H is the subgroup G inverse HG. So it's the set of all products G inverse HG where little h runs over big H. We say that H is a normal subgroup, and so that's the name. If it satisfies G inverse HG equals H. Now, when you look at G inverse HG equals H, something should be screaming at you that you want to do. What would you love to do to both sides of G inverse HG equals H? Yeah, multiply by G. So this is really the same as GH equals HG. Does that remind you of anything? So the right coset is the same as the left coset, but what property does this kind of look like? It looks like commutative. Commutative means if I give you any two elements, it doesn't matter the order in which I multiply them. Is this saying that the group is commutative? 
No, but it's measuring how close to commutative it is. How much does it fail by? It's not saying that you can switch the multiplication, but it says when you multiply, you're only going to be off by an element in H when you multiply elements in H by anything in G. So this is uh, not going to be true of every subgroup. And so if you look at the dihedral group, one of the subsets is normal, one of the subsets is not normal. It's the normal ones that are going to be more useful for breaking down a complicated group. So example 6.6, .6, if G is an abelian group, then every subgroup is normal. Since G inverse HG, since it's commutative, I can just move the G next to the G inverse and I just get H. So for abelian groups, it's very easy to break an abelian group up into a smaller, simpler group. So abelian groups are very easy to understand. Just basically take any subgroup and then you can form your coset group. A non-abelian group is far harder. What is the first question you would want to ask about a non-abelian group and normal subgroups? So what might you want to know? I'm sorry? So is there a normal subgroup? Can you give me a normal subgroup of a group G? You should be immediately thinking of two things right now. So you should be immediately saying in your mind, let me try one of these two things, right? We're deep enough into the semester. So what's the first thing you wanna try if I ask you, can you give me an example? of a subgroup? What's the first thing you think of? No. Yeah. What do you mean by zero? Yeah, the trivial case. So what's the first trivial case? The identity. Or the whole group. Do both of those work? Yes. If you take the identity, so if H is just the identity, then clearly G inverse HG is just going to be the identity. If you take H to be the entire group, then clearly it's going to work. Wonderful. Every group has a normal subgroup. Should we be happy? No. no why not? No, we should always be happy. You shouldn't be sad. It's bad to be sad, okay? We shouldn't be happy, though, that we found two normal subgroups, right? We want to find non-trivial normal subgroups because the whole goal is to try to break G into something small and more understandable. And so if we can understand G mod H and H, we then use that to understand G. Well, if H is all of G, then G mod H is just the identity. It's a trivial breakup. Similarly, if G is the identity, then you know G mod H is just G. And again, it's a trivial breakup. So the only time that this is going to be useful is when we have a situation when we have a non-trivial normal subgroup. So that's what we really want to find. So the question is, does every group have a non-trivial normal subgroup? So you should be able to give me an example of a group that does not have a non-trivial normal subgroup. Uh, Dihedral actually does have one. So what's one way to make sure you can't have a non-trivial normal subgroup? So we know every group has to have at least two subgroups. What's a good way to ensure that you have no non-trivial normal subgroups? What does it mean for a group to be trivial? I'm sorry? Okay, so that's one possibility. So if G equals E, there's no non-trivial. What else could work?
So if you want to have a non-trivial normal subgroup, what must you have? You must have a, I'm sorry? If you want one of the, if you want to have a non-trivial normal subgroup, what must you have if there's even a chance to have a non-trivial normal subgroup? Just remove one of the words. If you're going to have a non-trivial, you must have a subgroup that's non-trivial, right? So if I can give you a group that has no non-trivial subgroups, could it possibly have a non-trivial normal subgroup? So can you give me a group that has no non-trivial subgroups? Okay, which cyclic group? What should the power of G be to ensure? So we're looking at a cyclic group. When will a cyclic group have no non-trivial subgroups? If it's a prime, excellent. So P is prime. So this has P elements. So by Lagrange, no non-trivial subgroups. If I gave you G equaled E, uh, G, G squared, all the way up to say G to the 11, then we could have you know E, G cubed, G to the sixth, G to the ninth, we could have e, g to the fourth, g to the eighth. We could have e, g to the sixth. And I forgot e, g squared, g to the fourth, g to the sixth, g to the eighth, g to the tenth. So here, I could have lots of different subgroups. So you know, we definitely have an example of a group G that can't be broken up any further. And so one of the big questions is always going to be, when can you break up a group into smaller groups to try to understand? This you know, cyclic group, it's good to know this as an example, but this is kind of a trivial example in that the group has no non-trivial subgroup, so it clearly can't have a non-trivial normal subgroup. I want to find an example of a group that has non-trivial subgroups, but doesn't have any non-trivial normal subgroups. And if I have something like that, then I'm in trouble. I can't maybe break it up any further. Okay, so the next one is if we have a homomorphism of groups, so what does it mean to be a group homomorphism? So C sends the identity, the identity, and what else? Then the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of G. So this gives us actually a way to find some normal subgroups. You remember, we're trying to find normal subgroups so we can break things up. Here is a way. Try to find a group homomorphism between G and G prime. And then the kernel of this is going to be a subgroup of G. So let's prove this. What do we have to do to prove that it's a subgroup? Closure. Save it to proof first. So let's say phi of G1 equals phi of G2 equals E prime. And phi of G1, G2 is phi of G1, phi of G2 is E prime times E prime is E prime. It's closed. What about associativity? So we're looking at the set of all things in the kernel. How do we prove associativity? So 
So this is enough to show, you know, if G1, G2, G3 are in the kernel of C, then G1, G2, G3 is the same as G1, G2, G3. How would we prove that? So, but how is that going to show G1, G2 times G3 is the same as G1 times G2, G3? You're making the proof too hard. Where do the Gs live? They live in G. What do we know about big G? It is a group. So what's the word that we want to use here? It's inhabited. Right? Big G is a group. Big G is associative. I'm trying to prove that the set of elements in the kernel of phi is a subgroup. Well, because all the elements in the kernel of phi live in big G, and big G is associative, then this set is also associative. So we have to check these things, but a lot of times the proof is not too bad if you just remember where you're looking. We need the identity as your know, phi of E is equal to E prime, we get that E is in the kernel of E. And the last thing we need is inverses. If G is in the kernel of E, then phi of G, G inverse is phi of G, phi of G inverse, or phi of E is phi of G, phi of G inverse. But phi of E is E prime, therefore we get E prime is phi of G, phi of G inverse. So phi of G inverse equals phi of G inverse. We have to be careful where you put the parentheses. So phi of G whole thing inverse is the same as phi of the quantity G inverse. But we're assuming G is in the kernel of phi. As G is in the kernel of phi, that gives us E prime is E prime phi of G inverse. So phi of G inverse also is E prime. We actually, I believe, proved that the kernel is a subgroup a long time ago, but since it's been a while, it's not bad to just redo the proof. So this is the proof that it is a subgroup. Now, what do we want to do? We now want to show it. So this shows the kernel of phi is a subgroup. Now we want to show normal. So what does it mean to show something is normal? So we have to show, oops. So for all G and G, um, G kernel P G inverse equals kernel P. Or we technically just have to say it's contained in. Ah, uh, that's just okay. 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 So how would we show that G kernel phi G inverse is equal to the kernel phi? We have to do two inclusions, right? We have to go in two directions. So let H be in the kernel of phi, then phi of G inverse H G is phi of G inverse phi of H phi of G. What does that equal?
because h is in the kernel, this is just e prime over here. So this is just phi of g inverse phi of g, which is phi of g inverse g, which is phi of e, which is e prime. So we get g kernel of phi g inverse is a subset of the kernel of phi. So does everyone agree that we have now proved one direction? We've proven the set on the left is contained in the set on the right. If not, please speak up and you know, we can look at this calculation again more carefully. But we basically just say, well, look, let's take an arbitrary element on the left. So take some element h in the kernel of phi. So look at you know g inverse hg, apply phi. And then the only thing we can do is it's a group homomorphism. Phi of a product is the product of the phi's. Because h is in the kernel, phi of h is the identity. And that allows us to move the phi of g inverse and the phi of g next to each other, which then cancel. How would we do the other direction? How would we show that the kernel of phi is contained in here? So this was only doing in one direction. How would you do the other direction? Other direction is replaced G with G inverse. So if you think about it, if you're trying to show that this left-hand side, G kernel of phi G inverse equals kernel of phi, I have to show the left is contained in the right and the right is contained in the left. Well, if I wanna show that the right is contained in the left, I could multiply by G inverse on the left and then G on the right. And then that's the same um, as then showing that G inverse kernel phi G is contained in the kernel of phi. Let me add a piece of paper. G inverse kernel of phi G is containing it, right? And this is for all G and G. So G, oh, it's a, G inverse kernel of phi Right? Does everyone agree that that's the other direction we have to do? Yes. This is the same as the kernel of phi contains G kernel of phi G inverse. So just use this with G inverse for G. The first equation holds for any element in the group. So take not, so if you wanna do this, apply this not to the element G, but to the element G inverse. So that yields G inverse inverse kernel phi G inverse is contained in the kernel of phi or G kernel of phi G inverse is contained 
in the kernel of food. This is a really nice trick that you only have to do one direction. Once you do one direction, you get the other one for free. We're doing this for an arbitrary element G. Just take G to be G inverse. And then you get the relationship you want. So we've shown that we have a way to find normal subgroups. We just have to have a homomorphism between two groups. And we need a group homomorphism. We know how to find group homomorphisms. The question is, when will the kernel of phi be a non-trivial subgroup of G? That's the difficulty. You know, this will definitely give us examples, but it may not give us you know, the example we want. You know, it might just give us, yes, we have a normal subgroup, but the normal subgroup might be all of G, or it might be the identity. But it at least gives us a possible way to find this. So again, you know, the key definition here is a normal subgroup. And so a normal subgroup is G inverse H, G equals H. So when we conjugate H on the left by G inverse and on the right by G, we get back the same set H. Maybe the elements are in a different order. Okay. So this is one of the key properties in group theory is you know, a subset that is not just a subgroup, but a normal subgroup. Okay, so the next one is let G be a sub, I'm sorry, let G be a group, H is a subgroup. If G inverse HG is contained in H for all G and G, then H is a normal subgroup. It's enough to check just one inclusion. We actually just did that a moment ago. And again, this should remind you a little bit of linear algebra that class you remember so well, where if you want to prove something is a subspace, you just show that if I give you any two scalars A and B, and any two vectors v and w, a v plus b w is in the set. Yes. Sorry, I'm a little off topic. Will there be a normal subgroup as well? Um, it reminds me a little bit of an ideal. Right. And so we will eventually get into special types of ideals in rings. And you're just you know similar to the idea of we want subgroups that have good properties we will want ideals that have good properties. And unfortunately, the intuition we have from numbers doesn't generalize as well in rings. So in numbers, we have unique factorization. Not all rings are going to have that and things are gonna get much worse. And there's gonna be a difference in rings between what's an irreducible element and what's a prime element. Whereas in integers, they're the same. And this is, you know, it's a great question. This is sadly something that happens all the time. We are looking at such a simple example initially that we can be confused and think that these concepts are the same, but they're really uh, different when you get to a larger uh, scene. So the next one is for all G and G, the conjugate set G inverse HG is a subgroup of G. And then the last, um, does anybody know why there's a slash between D and map? My cursor was accidentally there, I guess, when I was taking the picture. And I didn't notice it. That's why there's a slash between that. Um, I don't know if I can do this. Yes, I can. So I can just write over it and write. Excellent. So for all G and G, the, uh, okay, part C, the map H goes to G inverse HG, defined by sending H to G inverse HG as a group isomorphism. In particular, if H is finite, then H and its conjugates all have the same number of elements. So we've already proved A. For B, we want to show that this is a subgroup. How do you show something is a subgroup? Identity, closure, inverse, associative. So the set G inverse HG is a set. G inverse HG is the set of all things, you know, G inverse HG where H is an H. Closure, if we have G inverse H1G and G inverse HCG, what's the first thing you notice? Here?
So you have G inverse H1G, G inverse H2G. What can we do? Yeah, what's true about GG inverse? It's the identity. So this just becomes G inverse H1, H2, G, which is in G inverse HG. So if we start off with something in G inverse HG and we multiply by something in G inverse HG, we get something in G inverse HG. All the other properties are done very similarly. Okay, I'll leave the rest for you. You know, the rest is similar. What do you think the identity element is? It's not going to be the identity. Where does G inverse HG live? It lives in G. So if it lives in G, its identity should be E. So you just have to show that the identity is in it. What about associativity? Yeah, it should inherit it. And then G H inverse G is the inverse of G H G. So I have, uh, where's my inverse? Inverse is on the left. G inverse H inverse G is the inverse of G inverse H G. You can go through and you can show that you know, it satisfies all the properties, it is a subgroup. And the reason is whenever you multiply anything together, the GG inverses in the middle are going to cancel, and then you'll have the Gs on the outside. And then the last is that we have a group isomorphism. Basically, we just take H, we're just putting you know, G inverse on the left, G on the right. So you can go through and you can show that you have a one-to-one -one onto map. So the question is, have you ever seen anything like this before? He says, hopefully, yes. What class am I going to call on now? Linear algebra. So do you remember the spectral theorem? If A is you know, real symmetric, it exists an orthogonal Q such that and you can do it two different ways. You know, A equals uh, Q transpose lambda Q, where lambda uh, lambda one to lambda n is the matrix of eigenvalues. You haven't seen this in linear algebra, but just pretend you have, so I don't feel bad. Okay. Yes, you've all seen this? Yes, of course you have. Of course you've seen this because this is one of the most important results in linear algebra, that if I give you a real symmetric matrix, it can be diagonalized. And diagonal matrices are much easier to work with. Um, if you have seen this, and are so enchanted with it that you would love to talk about how much you've seen it with either myself or the TA, please feel free to do so, okay? So why is this so important? Let's say you wanna calculate A to the N. Oh, not A to the N. Let's say you wanna calculate A to the M. That's gonna be Q transpose lambda Q times Q transpose lambda Q dot, 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 Q transpose lambda Q. What do you notice is going to happen? when you do this multiplication out. Yeah, every time you get a QQ transpose, it's gonna cancel. And this is just gonna become Q transpose lambda to the NQ. So if you wanna calculate a high power of a matrix, if the matrix can be diagonalized, this is actually really easy to do. Yeah. You give me a diagonal matrix, I wanna raise this to the nth power, not a big deal. I can just raise each entry in the diagonal to the nth power. And then I conjugate by my QQ transpose. What's the relationship between Q transpose and Q for orthogonal matrices? They give you the identity. So what's the relationship between Q and Q transpose? 
inverse. They're inverses, right? So Q transpose is Q inverse. This is conjugation. And from a computational perspective, you know, if I give you an n by n matrix you know, to calculate high powers, that's painful. If I give you a diagonal matrix to calculate high powers, that's trivial. So there's a lot of things in linear algebra where systems evolve over time and the matrix tells you how things evolve. I feel very strongly that you should be able to answer the who gives a shit question. You know, why are you learning this? Well, here's a great example from linear algebra where we're seeing this conjugate structure. So why might you want to look at a conjugate uh, structure? Here's a great example from linear algebra. It's much easier to work with this conjugate. Does the universe care how I orient the coordinate axis? Really? You can prove this. You can prove the universe doesn't care. We don't believe the universe cares how we orient the coordinate axis. We'll act under that assumption. That's what we're doing over here when we conjugate. We're taking our transformation and we're writing it in a basis that's easier to look at. Um, so for example, you're building on your wonderful knowledge of linear algebra. I know you all remember your conic section. So if I give you an ellipse like this, the equation of the ellipse is x over a squared y over b squared equals 1. But I could be sure that this is going to happen. And I might give you instead an ellipse that's rotated. And you probably do not think of, you know, how would you do this in high school? Well, the solution is you draw a new coordinate axis. And here's u, here's v. And in these new coordinate axes, it's u over a squared plus v over b squared equals 1. And then how do we get from x, y to u, v? We get from x, y to u, v by rotation. So u, v is maybe some rotation matrix acting on x, y, where maybe q is cosine theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. And I can actually write this in matrix form. This is really the same as x, y, and the matrix 1 over a squared, 0, 0, 1 over b squared, x, y equals 1. So I can, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to do the details. I can write this down in the standard form in UV space. And then because UV is some rational, is this a rotation times XY, I can expand this out and get a real symmetric matrix. And I can represent this ellipse. It's going to be XY times some matrix A11, A12, A21, A22, XY. I'll get something like that. And that is the general equation of an ellipse with center at the origin. We can actually write it down. And so the goal here is to just show you that the stuff that we're doing in abstract algebra right now, it's actually connected to other math that you've seen. You know, there is a reason why we're spending time on this. And there's a reason why linear algebra is a prereq for this class. OK, the next thing is let G be a group and H a normal subgroup. Suppose that G1, G1 prime, G2, G2 prime are in G, and they satisfy G1 prime H equals G1H. So those two cosets are the same. And G2 prime H equals G2H. Then G1 prime, G2 prime H equals G1, G2H. So this is basically saying if H is normal, multiplication of cosets is well-defined. So this is basically what we showed earlier. When we showed that what we needed for everything to work out was we needed H to have this property, which we then extracted and isolated and said, anything that has that property we'll call normal. 
And so I'll let you read the book you know, for the details. It's very similar to what we've already done. Okay. But essentially it says that if you have a normal subgroup, then multiplication is well-defined on the cosets. Okay. So the next one is a little bit more involved. Um, I just want to make sure we get you know through stating all of these for the next class. So as always, G is a group and H is a subgroup. Now this is where things get interesting. I would probably not use the the letter H here. I would use a different letter because then I would look down and see when I see that letter that it's a normal subgroup. What letter would you use? Yeah, I'd probably use N. Sometimes people use K for normal subgroup. Yeah. But yeah, I would use another letter like that to just remind myself that it's not just a subgroup, it's a normal subgroup. So the first is the collection of cosets is a group via the well-defined group operation. We basically just proved this. That's what the last lemma was doing, that coset multiplication is well-defined. It would be horrible if it depends which representative you use. And that's what we're worried about. The next thing is that the map phi, which sends G to the cosets, is a homomorphism whose kernel is H. And again, this is just go through, and I strongly urge you to do these exercises. If you are having trouble and you want me to do them in class on Thursday, let me know. And again, we can have Thursday as a split class. So if you think about it, what's the identity? Well, when I look at the cosets, the identity coset is just what? So what would be the identity coset when I'm looking at G mod H? Well, what's the identity coset? You have to give me a coset. You know, the cosets are the form G times H for some G. Which G or which Gs give me the identity coset? The identity coset is just H, right? It's just E times H, or it could be any little H times H. So the second thing is saying that if you look at the group homomorphism, the kernel is H. The only things that get sent to the identity coset are the things that are in H. The next one is, let's say we have a homomorphism between two groups with the property that H is contained in the kernel, then there's a unique homomorphism satisfying certain properties. So there's a lot of different facts that you should be aware of. And what we're essentially saying here is we may not have an isomorphism, we may not have an equivalence of things initially, but we do if we restrict things. So at a high level, let's consider the function f of x equals x squared. Yeah. This should be back to things we understand. Right. Can somebody tell me what the plot of this looks like? Parabola. So is f from r to r a bijection? What do you think? Is this a one-to-one -one on two map? No. What property does it fail? Okay, good. So you have two different X's that go to the same Y. What else does it feel? You know, it all Y's hit. So it's really not a bijection. It's not one to one, it's not onto. But if we consider F from zero infinity to zero infinity, that's a bijection. And so you might have something that's initially not a bijection, but if you restrict the output space and you restrict the input space, we can make it a bijection. That's what we're really saying over here. Okay? This is the English for the mathematics over here. Instead of looking at all G prime, just look at the image. Well, it's clearly going to be subjective onto the image because what is the image? It's all things hit. 
And then what we're doing is we're modding out basically by you know things that are sent to the identity. And that's gonna give us back the one-to-one. -one. Okay. And so that's gonna finish off section 6.1. And then for the next class, we're gonna start with section 6.2, groups acting on sets. And one of the reasons we're gonna care so much about this is we're gonna be able to use this to start getting some information about the structure of groups. And so the whole idea is, if I tell you some properties of a group, what do I then know about the group? So this is a good place to stop.